Today is a day of great joy for the whole Pauline community around the world because a number one of our members has finished the race, completed the course, and has entered into eternity, a time of great joy. However, there is a tendency amongst the people of God Odd that when a nun, a brother, a priest, a monk dies, uh, to presume that they go straight to heaven and they aren't uh, in need of our prayers the way other people need the prayers. Well, as Gershwin said in an old song, it ain't necessarily so. <laughs> now, we need to pray today. We've gathered for prayer. There are four types of prayer. First, there's the prayer of adoration, and we give thanks to God for being God, and we rejoice in that. And then there's the prayer of thanksgiving, and we're giving thanks to God for having created and formed a father, Tom, and having us had the opportunity to know him and to love him. And then there's the prayer of lamentation. And that too, we put our grief before God. If there was no lamentation, there would be no love. When people lament the loss of a loved one, it shows their heart is bleeding at the exact spot. It was attached to the person who has died. But finally, there's the prayers of petition which we have to offer for Father Tom. Throughout his life, he prayed more for the souls of purgatory than anyone else I knew. On a daily basis, he prayed for them, over and over. And so in order to honor him, we should pray for his soul too. And if he has sprang into eternity and is seeing the face of God at this moment, the prayers for him will simply redound on those souls that need the prayers the most. But we should pray every day for him as he prayed every day for the others who are going through a purgation process. Now, sacramentally, he was certainly prepared for his death. He went to confession frequently. In recent months, he made a general confession of his entire life. And he said his divine office on a daily basis. So in that sense, he was prepared. And he had another devotion, praying for those who died unprepared. He prayed all the time for people around the world who would be dying with no preparation to meet the judgment of God. Well, ironically, he wasn't prepared to die himself. He was prepared to live. He wasn't giving up. He wanted to do one more thing for the divine master. He wanted to do one more thing for the church. He wanted to do one more thing for the society of St. Paul. He wanted to do more for the Holy Family and its members, the people he loved the most on a spiritual plane. So he wasn't prepared to die. He was prepared to live. But the Lord had a different plan, calling him back home to himself. And now he's in a position to do more for us than he could have ever done in this world. Now his life was one of suffering and service. His mother died within the first year of his birth. His father just handed him over to his three aunts, the three sisters of his mother, and he was raised by these three hardworking, courageous, and pious women. And he learned a great deal from them by their example, but early on, asthma struck him. When he was six, seven years old, he struggled to breathe. He couldn't play with the other kids. It was a great burden. Now, he was the smartest kid in his class. And he said his main mistake was 
He was not smart enough to hide it. <laughs> and so he became the victims of bullies, really bad bullying. Whenever the teacher would ask a question, who could answer this? It's he, me, 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 and it's all, oh, of course, Tommy, what's the answer? And then after school, he would get a different answer from his classmates. <laughs> And one time he was so brutally uh, abused and beaten that he had to take an entire year off from school. And his aunts had to more or less homeschool him and try to repair him for a year. Uh, early suffering. But then he, in high school, he went with the Presentation Brothers who kept everything under control. And he loved the brothers. He thought they were doing a great job. And he contemplated, I wouldn't mind being a brother, but asthma makes it impossible graduates, gets a few jobs, and then he finally gets a good job with the electric company and he wanted to work in Cork. But they sent him to some other place that he hardly heard of, Athlone. Goes to Athlone and one of his supervisors, recognizing the spirituality of Father Tom, said, you know, I know this priest, Father Simone, in the society of St. Paul, I want you to meet him. And he met Father Simone, and Father Simone said, why don't you join the society? You could work as a writer, an editor, etc." He said, I'd love to, Father, but it's impossible. I'm just too sickly. Uh, Father Simone didn't take that uh, as a definitive answer. Took him to a doctor that he knew and said, tell him he's healthy. Well, <laughs> <laughs> and so he went off to Italy be formed in the congregation, the Society of St. Paul. He brought with him already a great amount of spirituality in the rosary, the stations of the cross, daily communion. That was already a part of the fabric of his life. And he said when he got to the society for the first time, and he was heading towards the dining room, he thought all the students would be whispering in hushed silence topics of philosophy and theology. And when he walked into the dining room, there was an enormous uproar, a cacophony of sounds as young men were laughing, debating, yelling, you know, passing the pasta back and forth. <laughs> and for a year or so, he had good health, but then his health declined rapidly, and his fears began to mount that he just couldn't make it physically. But Blessed Alberioni saw something in him, kept him under his wing, kept encouraging him, and wanted so much for this young Irish cleric to succeed, and he succeeded indeed. He was ordained in July of 57. It would have been 60 years this year. He was a person of great devotion and great zeal for the church. There's no need to go through all of the things he accomplished in life. You could see that in the obituary, especially the extended one that has just come from Rome. But behind all of his work was that suffering and service motif. He spent one year in Staten Island, and there was a famous diocesan priest, Monsignor Florence Cohelan. And I happened to casually remark to Monsignor Cohelan, what do you think of Father Tom? And Cohelan said, he's a tower of strength. He could see the steel in uh, Father Fogarty's backbone. He could see the dynamism there of a man who truly was a believer. When he arrived in Canfield, he took over from the beloved Father Felix, uh, the institutions, the Gabrielites, the Annunciationists, but in a special way, the Holy Family Institute, to which he gave every waking hour to. His suffering here physically was over the years pretty intense. His hip was disintegrating, he had a hip replacement. Then, not long after that, he fell and broke his femur. Then in rehab, they dropped him and he broke the femur again. And then after he got through those breaks, he was back here and he was coming into the chapel to say the Stations of the Cross. Whenever it was physically possible, he prayed the Stations every day. 
And as he's coming in, he trips, falls, breaks his shoulder. And it was a bad break. And he said, I don't understand it. Already he was beginning to revert to a simple theology. He said, why would the Lord do that to me? If I was going to do something sinful, I could see him, you know, knocking me down. I was going to say the stations of the cross. Why would that happen? And I said to him, and Father Tom falls for the third time. <laughs> and he had that same reaction. He had a, a, an enormous uproarious laughter at that. In fact, he repeated it to quite a few people. But he was a man that had a great deal of suffering, a great deal of devotion. He was dedicated to the Holy Family Institute and he would grieve for those who would die or would have difficulties in their life. And with the conflicts and challenges that come into every marriage, even the most holy ones, he would feel the pain that was going on. And he was an unusual man in a sense. He had a beautiful tenor voice, but he wouldn't sing the traditional Irish tunes you would think that an Irish priest would sing. He would sing cowboy songs. <laughs> and his favorite would be, I've got spurs that jingle, jangle, jingle. As I ride merrily along. And I always think, oh God, I thank you that I'm single. <laughs> <laughs> because he could see the burdens that would be a part of every married life. And he would pray for the people in the midst of that holy struggle that would be so important in his life. Now, as he enters eternity, as he goes before St. Peter, the traditional vision of the way people enter the heavenly kingdom, I could see him going up to Peter and say, you know, you were a married man, you're eligible to join the Holy Family Institute. <laughs> <laughs> We'd be happy to have you. <laughs> but now as Tom enters his eternal rest, we should be grateful, thankful for having known him and pray for him that one day we will meet him in eternity where every tear is wiped away, every sin obliterated, and all of us can rejoice in that one family that has no end, the family of the people of God from every race and nation. <laughs>